Um, yeah, it's Peter said, I'm a, I'm a research agronomist with New South Wales uh, DPI here at Wagga and, uh, and I've been working on the uh, Evercrop uh, project for the last, uh, well, six years really. Now Evercrop is not to be um, uh, confused with Evergraze, which Michael talked about before, Evergraze of the dark side. Evercrop <laughs> is about... Uh, you okay? <laughs> Evercrop's about perennials in cropping rotations. Okay, so, so that's our focus. Evergraze tends to be more up in the, you know, the, the, the sheep only or the sheep, oh, sorry, livestock dominant areas. Uh, Evercrop is about perennials but, but in the, the cropping zone environment. So that's the key distinction. Okay. So just a, a very brief overview and I'll, I will try and get through this pretty quickly. Uh, the, the purpose of, of Evercrop is to evaluate and develop uh, the role of perennials in crop livestock uh, systems in southern Australia. We've got three main nodes of activity, um, the, the South Australian Victorian Mallee and, and their main emphasis is actually looking at, uh, because of course there's, there's not a lot of livestock there and there's certainly not a lot of perennials and, and, and their main emphasis is looking at uh, uh, shrubs, uh, identifying shrubs that might be useful in their production system. Similarly, the northern WA wheat belt, uh, there's, there's not a lot of livestock there and there's certainly not a lot of perennials. They're looking at the, the potential role of uh, tropical grasses uh, and using it in a, in a pasture cropping system. But for, for southwest New South Wales, where we are here and the, and the, the location that I look after, uh, the, the situation's a bit different because, of course, we've got plenty of perennials here and I'll talk about that in a second. And, of course, it, it's a good length... Um, project. Uh, somebody said earlier you, you don't make uh, changes in, in agriculture in, in sort of one year or, or one project. So what we've had is sort of a, a, a successive project that's, that's gone over a reasonable length of time which has given us the opportunity to sort of uh, tackle some more complex issues which uh, one of which is I'm, I'm going to talk about. So, so for us in, in, in South West New South Wales the case for increased adoption of perennials wasn't particularly strong. Uh, we've grown loosen here since you know, the early 1800s, as, as, as you well know. A um, recent survey that, that our project conducted um, in, in the sort of around Wagga, the area around Wagga, says that approximately 50% of the land is under pasture, although obviously that varies from farm to farm, and 30% of, of land is under perennial pasture. Um, moreover, the, the, a little bit of modelling that we do, did, uh, bioeconomic modelling, suggested that that was probably a, around the optimal level. So, so there wasn't a big case for us in this zone to, uh, to you know, really plug perennials or, or go out and find necessarily new perennials. Well, we, we did try that, but there's not that many options available. What we found was that 72% of growers use lucerne in their mix. So lucerne is probably the key perennial in the, in the cropping zone and there's certainly plenty of it out there. So, so our challenge was a little bit different to the challenge in the other nodes of our, of our project. Now in terms of pasture performance, um, this will be, be obvious in a, I guess to, to many of you, but, but pasture performance is clearly important and according to uh, one of our project surveys we found that sort of 69% of growers ranked poor establishment as one of the top three reasons for ending a pasture phase. 75% of growers ranked poor persistence as one of the top three reasons for ending a pasture phase. So establishment and persistence are clearly issues and, and they're clearly linked too. If, you, if your pasture establishes poorly it's unlikely uh, to persist very well or it's, it, it's unlikely to, to, to meet your objectives as a farmer and, and you're likely to take it out earlier. Okay, so we were able to define a knowledge gap in our project and this is what we sort of set about to to unravel uh, over, over our project period and, and we're still going incidentally this this work is ongoing but we had over 80 years of, of agronomy field experiments pasture agronomists such as, as myself um, you know running field field trials and, and publishing it and, and the the data over over that period overwhelmingly suggested that pastures should not be established under a cover crop and the reasons for that are probably pretty obvious when you when you grow a pasture by itself uh, it's got a chance when you pass, grow a pasture under a crop, it's got the extra competition of a very vigorous crop, which depending on conditions could sap moisture, could sap light, could sap nutrients, and therefore could lead to poorer establishment. So there's, there's no rocket science in that. And, and there's plenty of people gone before that have, have shown that. Yet our surveys showed that over 80% of farmers in, in, in our zone um, used cover crops to establish pastures. So this was, to us, uh, a, a pretty clear knowledge gap and something that we thought required a little bit further uh, investigation. We knew the importance of establishment. We knew, 
you know, the experts said that we shouldn't be cover cropping, but we, we knew that most farmers were cover cropping. So why that disparity? Now just before we get going and take a moment to, to consider a definition, I consider, I, I use the words cover crop and under sowing interchangeably, uh, and it's the simultaneous establishment of a, of a crop and a pasture in the same paddock at the same time. So you, you sow the crop, um, and it, it's sown in autumn, autumn and early winter, earlier the better incidentally, um, but you sow the, the seed together, the crop grows, you harvest the grain and, and the, the pasture stays on you know, for, for grazing in years following that, that grain harvest. Okay, it's worth considering the importance of successful establishment and, and some of this seems obvious but it, sometimes it's overlooked. When you're talking about a pasture you're talking about a, a block of ground that's 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 been sown down for a period of three to, to twenty plus years, depends on the farmer. Um, when you're talking about establishment, you, you, you're, you're keen to enhance perennial plant longevity. If you're sowing loose and you want the loosen to survive. You're also, in, invariably, you'll sow subclover with that loosen, which is an annual plant, so it relies on seed set uh, in order to come back in future years. So the, the establishment of the annual in that first year and its ability to set seed in that first year uh, contributes to its persistence and the productivity that you'll get beyond that establishment year. And of course the sequence of years is important. You know, you get, a, you get an okay establishment year followed by a very dry year, you'll get a different outcome to if you get an okay establishment year followed by a very wet year. And of course you'll never ever get the same sequence of years. Of course, increased production equals incre increased return on investment, but in terms of a pasture it's a little bit more complicated. You know, you can you, you consider a crop, you increase the productivity of the crop. Well, you know what that product productivity is because you run the header around and you take the, the product off and you know what that is. You increase the, the productivity of the pasture, but then you rely on, on what do they call it, maggot taxis, uh, sheep, to go and harvest that, that, that herbage to to then convert it into an animal product that then you, you can sell. So there's an indirect link there which makes things a little bit more complicated. But, but generally we want to increase our pasture production so we can increase our stocking rates so we can increase our, 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 our return on investment. Increased establishment, particularly of perennials, often reduces weed incursion, not always, but often, um, particularly if you're talking about something like loosen reducing the, the, the weed incursion from you know, those summer grasses that, that you know, highly vigorous, highly productive, but not very good value. Uh, an increased legume establishment, so loosen or clover, something a, a legume, uh, increased nitrogen fixation. So, and this is important too, and and this also adds to the complication because you're increasing the the, the nitrogen fixation. So that's more nitrogen that's available to the pasture to grow, particularly if you've got grasses in that sward as well. But it's also higher protein, higher quality feed for the livestock, so there's a benefit to you there. But it's also residual nitrogen that's going to be there for when you grow a crop as well. So, so again we've got this indirect effect where the, the, the benefit of improving establishment of your pasture is not easily recognised or not easily accounted for because it's, you know, it's indirect either through livestock or, or it's attributed to actually the cropping phase because you attribute it to the grain that comes off you know, in future years. So, so there's some sources of complexity there that are just worth considering. You, you, you probably know all that in the back of your mind, but it, it, I think sometimes it's glossed over. And of course there's, there's invariably other benefits too, uh, which we won't go into. Okay, so now when we consider the practice of cover cropping, we've got to consider, well, how do we, how do we balance the agronomy and, and the farm finance? Because all the studies that I mentioned before, well, they, they were agronomists, people like me, who, who measure success based on, you know, plant establishment, numbers of plants there or the, the amount of herbage that you produce. But as we know, as a farmer, you, you don't sell the numbers of plants or you don't sell the, the pasture herbage. It's got, to, it's got to go through another avenue in order for you to get that benefit. So how do you balance that? And that, this is really the, the crux of this cover cropping issue. And there's many factors to consider. I've listed a few, few things there. Grain price, obviously important. You're growing a, a cover crop to, to yield grain. What's the value of that grain? Grain yield. What's the effect of the comp competing pasture, so the loosen that's growing in underneath that wheat or barley crop or whatever it is? Uh, what's, what's the impact, the negative impact of the competition on the, on the grain yield? What's the livestock value? 
the, the, the value of the pasture to the livestock enterprise. Um, the, the pasture yield, well obviously that's a competition effect. How much does that crop reduce the, the yield of the pasture, the, the, ex, the establishment of the pasture? How long do you want the pasture there for? You know, is it a three year pasture? Well that's a different proposition to if, if you've got it there for, for 10 plus years. Uh, the, the pasture value in terms of that indirect effect on you know, the value of the pasture to the, to the cropping phase, because we, we've got them in phase rotations and there's, there's benefits across enterprises which are not easy to attribute, it, to attribute. And then of course you've got the unknown, the seasonal conditions and people would say well you know, when there's plenty of rain you can grow anything and, and that's pretty right. But, but of course season, co seasonal conditions are variable and, and unpredictable and, and you've got to have a, a, a decision process by which you can somehow account for that. Make, make an educated guess if you're going to make a guess. Okay, so, so just to describe the, the research activities that we did, we, we undertook some small plots, some s traditional small plot experiments to look at establishment and we were looking at, you know, uh, so, so considering the establishment of perennials that is, uh, spring versus autumn sowing, and when I say spring sowing I really mean in this area, sort of late August, a cover crop versus nil cover crop, what is the cost, the agronomic cost of, of growing those, the crop and the pasture together, and, and the different species that we've got, you know, so, so the, and the main ones that we've got here, Lucent, Chicory, Phalaris, Coxford. And in addition to the small plot research, we undertook some far what we called farmer participant research. So, so this is where we got the farmers to, to sow our trials for us. So they were the ones that determined what the, what the cover crop was. They were the ones that determined what the, the sowing rate of the cover crop was because they do it anyway. And, and we just went and helped them to set it up in such a way that we could collect some meaningful data. So if their cover crop which I think in this example was 25 kilos a hectare of wheat, well we just get them uh, you know, to sow a strip, and this one was about a kilometre long with their air seeder, and turn the crop, crop seed off for that strip. Or uh, we may have got them to do a half rate as well just for our curiosity. So very simple trials, more about awareness uh, and, and, and you know, getting farmers involved, but useful data as well. And of course it's quite impressive because all of those stars on the map um, represent a, a field site that we ran um, during the Evercrop uh, project. So uh, we've got sites now as north as Condo, down towards Burrumbuttick, um, some, some out to the west such as Marool and, and then to the, to the east, Urangili, those sorts of places. But of course, recognising what I said at the start where you know, you've got 80 years of, of, of research, of, of data that says you, know, you shouldn't cover crop and, and we'll very much aware of the fact that we could have just been another one of those studies to be quoted, you know, the, to show that, oh well, you know, cover cropping is not good. Um, we've shown it, but again, you know, practice hasn't changed. Farmers are still doing uh, what, what we think that they probably shouldn't be doing. So the, the important thing that we also did here is we, we tried to develop a decision support tool. Um, and it, it's currently at the prototype stage and, and after lunch we're, we're going to workshop this tool just to go through these, these issues in detail so, because it's still a work in progress. But essentially that's, that's, that's what it looks like. It's a very simple spreadsheet type calculator thing and, and all it is, it's an attempt to try and balance the, the well, it's an attempt to try and quantify the com complexity or, or account for the complexity and then balance these competing interests of the farm, of a, of a mixed farming enterprise. You've, you've, got your, you've got your livestock but your cropping is also important and then you've got to try and mix the two up. And at some point in time someone's going to have to make a judgment, the farm manager is going to have to make a judgment and say, well look, it's probably not perfect but this is going to be in the best interest of, of this farming enterprise. And, and the decision that he comes to might be completely different to the decision the, the next door neighbour uh, comes to in, in, in exactly the same year in a, in a similar environment. So we, we tried to develop a, a system where we could you know, very simply put inputs in that, that farmers could easily you know, put in uh, and, and just try and balance your, you know, the red and the blue line. When is, when is a cover crop an advantage and when is straight sowing an advantage? So we won't go through that now, that, that'll be an after lunch session to, to sort of explore that a bit more uh, f fully. It's worth considering the, the concept of um, success at establishment. You know, is, when you sow a pasture, did you get a, a successful establishment? And I'd probably argue that from a scientific perspective in, in any case, uh, you ra it's really quite difficult to define uh, a successful establishment. There, there's not very many well-established benchmarks for, so for example, you know, how many lucent plants should I have per metre squared or, you know, what, what 
what level of production should I be achieving? You know, the, the, the cropping industry have, have got some good benchmarks and, and, and um, you know, quite well studied benchmarks, I think. But, but the pastures, you know, you don't seem to have that uh, for, for pastures. So, so that doesn't help. Um, should we measure success in agronomic terms or should we measure it in economic terms? Um, as I said before, it's complicated by the, the, the interaction between the cropping and livestock um, enterprises within a farm. And it's actually likely to differ within farms or uh, between, faddocks, between paddocks within a farm or even between years within a paddock. You know, you sow a pasture this year in a given paddock, you'll get a different result next time, but does, uh, is either one more successful than the other? It, it's, it's quite complex. So, so if, you, if you struggle to define what a successful establishment is, it, it then becomes quite difficult to determine whether, well, you know, the method that you're, you're achieving to to uh, the method that you're using to achieve that establishment, whether that's successful or not too. And that's essentially what we're trying to do here. So just, just to labour that point, I guess, you know, you look at that, that photo, if you can see it, um, you know, if, if that was the paddock that you had before you, you'd just sown down, is, is that success? Um, you know, does that achieve your objectives? That's, is that what you're trying to get out of, out of your perennial base pasture? The, the weed there is flea bone, incidentally, but there is some loosen there as well. And, and perhaps a farmer might take the view that, well, you know, that's 80 hectare paddock around Area Park, that'll, that'll feed them a 500 sheep for a fair while, that, that does the job, maybe that's success. But I think you'd probably agree that, you know, we'd probably prefer that, which is, you know, a lot, a lot less flea bone and a lot more loosen. But of course, is that success? Because compared to that, you know, that's, that's only 9% flea bone and a, and a lot more loosen. So at, at what point is it successful or not? That's, that's essentially the question we're asking and, and where we'll get to in the workshop, I think, is to sort of say, well, look, it depends on what you value out of your pasture as to what your success is. And then we've got to use that to somehow make a decision as to whether, you know, you should be perhaps using a cover crop or not when you're establishing your perennial pastures. I think I just said that, that alert. Okay, last slide. And just uh, by way of flagging the, the future research because we've got three more years of this project. So what have we got left to do uh, between now and, and 2016? We, we've now collected enough data, I think, on the, uh, the agronomy data, I should say, uh, on the cover cropping that we can use that as the basis for, a, for an in-depth financial risk analysis on the practice of cover cropping. And what we'd hope to achieve out of that is to try and come up with some, perhaps some benchmarks. You know, if, if I could come to you as a farmer and say, look, if, if in all probability, you know, most years, if you could achieve two tonnes a hectare grain yield off your cover crop, it's, it's probably going to pay to, to do that. You know, that's hypothetical. That's the sort of benchmark that we might be looking to, to define with our, with our in-depth analysis. And of course, we've got to take into account things like um, weather variability and price variability, as well as the agronomy data. We've got, um, we're continuing agronomy trials, but we recognise that, you know, in contrast to what the, the previous, you know, pasture agronomy researchers said, where cover cropping is probably a bit of a waste of time and you shouldn't do it, we recognise there, there would be circumstances and, and we hope to define those circumstances where cover cropping would be um, of benefit, um, you know, to the bottom line. Um, so, so our trials now, the ones that we've just established at Condoblin and Cowra, uh, are to, to help us help refine the, the techniques of cover cropping. You know, how can, we, how can we establish a crop and reduce the impact on the pasture? How can we maintain our crop yield and also increase our, our pasture yield? And so one of the things that we're doing is, is this inter-row sowing thing where we've got loosening run, one row and the crop in the next. Uh, we're also looking at different crops. We've got, uh, you know, looking at wheat versus barley versus, versus canola. And we've even got a lupin treatment there just for, for, for my, my fun. Um, and then, of course, not related to the cover cropping, we've, we've, we've got a, agronomy trials, which some of you actually were at a field day earlier this week and saw, uh, and this is a photo of one, where we're trying to enhance the establishment of pastures in the absence of a cover crop. So if you make a decision that you're going to sow a pasture but you're not going to put a cover crop on top of it, how can we, how can we enhance that establishment and how can we reduce the risk of failure? And that's an example of where we've got a phalaris and loosen mixture and they're grown in, in, in alternate rows. And uh, look, I think it will leave.